I was very skinny, and I didn't have any curves. I guess my mother got kind of worried because she didn't think I had enough boyfriends. So she bought me a bra that you blow up. I was real excited, so I blew and blew to about 32. So I am going to talk about um, StoryCorps today. Um, I'm going to play a bunch of stories. I'm going to talk about our newest effort, One Small Step. Before I do, has anybody, well, has anybody here seen or heard a StoryCorps story? How many people here know StoryCorps? Okay, has anybody recorded a StoryCorps story? A couple of people. And who's asking, who's this guy standing between me and my coffee break that's coming up right after me? A couple of people. Um, okay, so StoryCorps is, is a very simple idea. It started 16 years ago. Um, we built a booth in Grand Central Terminal where you can bring anyone you want to honor by listening to their story, a parent, friend, grandparent. You come to this booth, you're met by a facilitator who works for StoryCorps, and you go inside with your grandparent. Facilitator's there, the lights are low, it's a sacred space. And you sit for 40 minutes with your grandmother and you talk and you ask questions. And I had made radio documentaries for decades before starting StoryCorps and knew that the microphone gives you the license to talk about things you never get to talk about. So um, almost everybody who's come to StoryCorps thinks of it as if I had 40 minutes left to live, what would I say to this person who means so much to me? At the end of the 40 minutes, you get a copy and another copy stays with us and it goes to the Library of Congress so your great, 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 great grandkids can get to know your grandmother through her voice and story. So it was kind of a crazy idea. Uh, when we started it, nobody came to the booth. It was empty. We had one person who came like 250 times because we had so many open slots. She'd grab people off of subways and interview them. She was a nut. That's all changed. Um, but I, I'm going to take, take you back to the very, very, very early days of StoryCorps with a foundational story. Um, and this is, this is really day one or day two of StoryCorps. And it's a couple who came to the booth. Um, his name uh, is Danny Parasa. His wife's name is Annie. And um, they wanted to tell the story of their first date that had happened 25 years before. Now, these are thick Brooklyn accents, so we've added subtitles to make sure that you can <laughs> understand what's being said. So this is Danny and Annie Parasa talking about their first date. She started to talk, and I said, listen, I'm going to deliver a speech. I said, at the end, you're going to want to go home. I said, you represent a 34-letter word. I said, that word is love. I said, if we're going anywhere, we're going down the aisle because I'm too tired, too sick, and too sore to do any other damn thing. And she turned around, and she said, well, of course I'm married. And the next morning, I called her as early as I possibly could. And he always gets up early. <laughs> to make sure she hadn't changed her mind, and she hadn't. And uh, every year on, on April 22nd, around 3 o'clock, I call her and ask her if it was today, would she do it again? And so far, the answer's been the same. Yeah, 25 times, yes. <laughs> you, you see, the thing of it is, I always feel guilty when I say I love you to you, and I say it so often. I say it to remind you that as dumpy as I am, it's coming from me. It's, it's like hearing a beautiful song from a busted old radio. And it's nice of you to keep the radio around the house. If I don't have a note on the kitchen table, I think there's something wrong. You write a love letter to me. Well, the only way. thing that could possibly be wrong is I couldn't find a silly pen. <laughs> to my princess, the weather out today is extremely rainy. I'll call you at 11.20 in the morning. It's a romantic weather. And I love you, I love you, I love you. When a guy is happily married, no matter what happens at work, no matter what happens the rest of the day, there's a shelter when you get home. There's a knowledge, knowing that you can hug somebody without them throwing downstairs and saying, get your hands off. <laughs> and it, it, being married is like having a color television set. You never want to go back to black and white. So Danny and Annie, um, Danny and Annie really personified some of the core values of StoryCorps, the poetry and the grace and the beauty and the eloquence and the stories hiding in plain sight all around us when we just take the time to listen. Um, they also became, because there were a lot of slots open at StoryCorps, super StoryCorps users. Um, they came back over and over again to read love letters to each other. Danny brought every character he had ever met in his life, uh, major league umpires and undercover narcotic de de narcotics detectives. He'd call us on a Thursday and say, I can't do his voice. He'd say, I'm having a cataract taken out on Monday. Do you need me to document it on Wednesday? And we'd say, sure, Danny, what the fuck? We, you know, we, we love you. Come on in. 
Um, and they became like family. A bunch of years later, Danny was diagnosed with end-state um, pancreatic cancer. Um, and at that time, we only had one booth. It was in Grand Central Terminal. And that week, he, we renamed the booth uh, in a ceremony, the Danny and Annie Parasa StoryCorps booth. Um, and then the next week, Danny called, and he said, I'm too sick to get to the booth, but I need to record one last interview with Annie. Will you come to my home in Sunset Park and do it? Um, and we did. So let's listen to the final interview between Danny and Annie. The illness is not hard on me. It's just, you know, the finality of it. And him, he goes along like a trooper. Listen, even downhill, a car doesn't roll unless it's pushed, and you're giving me a great push. <laughs> the deal of it is, we try to give each other hope, and not hope that I'll live, hope that you'll do well after I pass, hope that people will support her. Hope that if she meets somebody and likes him, she marries him. You know, he has everything planned, you know. I'm working on her. She said it was her call. She wants to walk out behind the casket alone. I guess that's the way to do it, because when we were married, you know how your brother takes you down, your father takes you down? She said, well, I don't know which of my brothers to walk in with. I don't want to offend anybody. I said, I got a solution. I said, you walk in with me, you walk out with me. And the other day, I said, who's going to walk down the aisle with you behind the casket? You know, to support her. And she said, nobody. I walked in with you alone. I walked out with you alone. Mm -hmm. There's a thing in life where you have to come to terms with dying. Well, I haven't come to terms with dying yet. I want to come to terms but being sure that you understand that my love for you up to this point was as much as it could be and will be as much as it could be for eternity. I always said the only thing I have to give you is a poor gift and it's myself. And I always gave it. And if there's a way to come back and give it, I'll do that too. Do you have the Valentine's Day letter there? Yeah. My dearest wife, this is a very special day. It is a day on which we share our love, which still grows after all these years. Now that love is being used by us to sustain us through these hard times. All my love, all my days, and more. Happy Valentine's Day. I could write on and on about her. She lights up the room in the morning when she tells me to put both hands on her shoulders so she can support me. She lights up my life when she says to me at night, wouldn't you like a little ice cream? Or would you please drink more water? I mean, those aren't very romantic things to say, but they stir my heart. In my mind, in my heart, there has never been, there is not now, and never will be another any. So we um, recorded that on a Thursday. We, have, we broadcast um, on NPR every Friday morning three-minute excerpts of the 40-minute interviews we do. Um, and we broadcast this the next um, Friday. And Danny died about an hour after the broadcast. Um, Annie um, got thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of letters from NPR listeners, condolence letters. And, you know, Michelle Obama was talking yesterday about um, people who feel like their lives don't matter. And Danny, who was an off-track betting clerk in New York, you know, he was, he was, he was five feet tall, he, had, he was bald, he had very crossed eyes and a snaggle tooth and his funny voice. And, you know, people would make fun of him. And he was one of those people who felt that maybe, you know, maybe he didn't matter. But Annie wanted, to know, wanted him to know that, that he did. So she uh, took a copy and buried them with him um, in his casket. And she kept a copy for herself, and still, many years later, she reads um, a story from Danny and, uh, and, and a letter, a condolence letter for Danny instead of the love letter that she would have gotten from him. So that's that's kind of a 
foundational early StoryCorps story. Um, jump ahead 16 years, StoryCorps all over the country. We now, when we open up reservations, we'll have thousands of people on waiting lists um, within seconds after we open it up. We've had half a million people participate in StoryCorps. It's the single largest collection of human voices ever gathered. Um, we've launched a bunch of initiatives over the years. Everyone who lost a loved one on September 11th comes to StoryCorps. Um, we have an African-American initiative with the National Museum of African-American History and Culture, which is the largest collection of African-American voices ever gathered. We launched an app that makes it possible to record StoryCorps interviews anytime, any place, and with one tap, upload them to the Library of Congress with the TED Prize, um, and much more. And I'm happy to announce today that um, for, the fir for the first time, that our entire collection of audio stories is right at this very moment being transcribed by Google Cloud, allowing for this archive of the wisdom of humanity to be searched and used in ways that we can't even imagine. So thank you, Cloud. That Thank you, Cloud. Sounds very new agey. Thank, thank you, Cloud. <laughs> thank you, Cloud. Um, I know we're going to be talking about uh, quantum supremacy after the break, so I thought I'd bring you up to date with a much more uh, recent story, core story um, about technological innovation, though it is circa 1935. 94-year-old um, Betty Jenkins came to StoryCorps uh, with her niece in Cincinnati. Um, and wanted to tell her about a newfangled contraption that she had gotten from her mother 70 years before, uh, an inflatable bra. I was very skinny, and I didn't have any curves. I guess my mother got kind of worried because she didn't think I had enough boyfriends. So she bought me a bra that you blow up. I was real excited, so I blew and blew to about 32. I was quite happy with the looks. I got a few wolf whistles. Of course, at that age, you were very self-conscious. That year, I took a trip to South America. I proceeded to fly to Santiago. Soon we were into the Andes Mountains, and it turned out that it was a non-pressurized plane, and I felt very uncomfortable. Things were getting very tight. This bra had started to increase in size. As the thing got bigger, I had tried to stand up, and I couldn't see my feet. The direction said it would go to 48 if I wanted to. I thought, what will happen if it goes beyond 48? And I found out what happened. It blew out. It was a loud, resounding sound. And the co-pilot came into the cabin with the gun, wondering what had happened. The men all pointed to me. Well, it's difficult to explain to people in English that part of your anatomy just blew up. But to try and do it in Spanish, it's beyond hope. So they made a landing. I was taken off the plane and turned over to two women police. And they told me to strip hunting for what they thought was the bomb. When I stripped down, I showed them the hole in the bra, and they chuckled. And I thought, oh my, they've gotten the point. And I was allowed back on the plane. A month later, I got a bill from the airline for $400 for an unscheduled stop. So I'm really excited to tell you about an effort we've been testing at StoryCorps for the past um, 18 months to try and deal with the growing cult culture of contempt across the political divides uh, in this country. It's, it's called One Small Step, and we're grateful to Google for making it the theme of Zeitgeist this year. Uh, as I mentioned, we've had half a million people who know and love each other 
participate in StoryCorps interviews to date. Uh, after or during the 2016 election, we started thinking about the possibility of putting strangers across the political divides into StoryCorps booths, not to talk about politics, but just to remember that people we disagree with are actually living, breathing human beings. We're a public service nonprofit, and our Hippocratic oath is that people who come to StoryCorps always benefit from the experience and are never harmed by it. So we needed to test this new kind of interview. We started with families, um, and I want to play an excerpt from a early te test interview. This is Jen Stanley, who was a former facilitator at StoryCorps, the people who sit in the booth bearing witness to the interviews, um, interviewing her dad, Peter, who is a construction worker in Boston. So this is one small step interview number one. I try to not bring up politics, but you always watch 5 o'clock news, and the minute any politician steps on, it doesn't matter who it is. I just cringe. And, Me too. Yeah, but you have to say something, whereas I would like to just pretend it's not happening. But maybe the answer is we don't watch the news when you're there. <laughs> maybe. But now I feel like we've gotten to this point where we're together and we're fighting about politics. And those would be the times when I hear you say, I can't even talk to you, Dad. If you're going to get so angry and flip out about it, then you know what? I'd rather you didn't talk to me. But see, this is what drives me crazy, though. You start these conversations. Well, I, I ask questions. What do you think about this? And what do you think about that? It's me trying to glean information from somebody who is significantly more educated than I am and whose opinions I trust. I'm really surprised to hear you say that. I, I had no idea that you were genuinely interested in what I had to say. I thought that you wanted to tell me how I was wrong and also make a joke about how I was silly. Uh, well, I would never feel that way about you. I have nothing but respect for you. I don't agree with you all the time. I don't agree with you most of the time, but that's okay. <laughs> we have a lot of things in common, and I do know that everything you did when you were a little kid was because you wanted to be like me. You even played softball, which you hated because I love I baseball. I did really hate it. I, know. <laughs> I mean, I just really worshipped you, Dad. I just thought that like everything that you thought and said was right. Mm -hmm. And you were just my best friend. But I think as I got older, I realized that you were really wrong about a lot of things. Well, you're probably right, Jen. I never professed to be right about everything. The important thing in our relationship is that you have your own beliefs and that I respect you for your beliefs. You were raised to be a sensitive, caring person and that's exactly who you are. You say that mm -hmm. and I feel loved, but I will say, I think you used to like me and I don't necessarily know that you like me anymore. Oh yeah, I like you a lot. It doesn't make me feel good that you say that. I don't agree with everything you say you do, but do I like you? Yeah, you bet I do. And I'm extremely proud of you. You know, when my time comes uh, to say, yeah, my father was a good man. We didn't agree politically, but uh, he was a good man. And if you can say that, then I'll be happy. I don't think that you're right all the time, but I think you're the best man. Well, thanks. And you're the best dad. I have a lot of stories I want to play for you. We're running very close to being out of time. Um, I, I, we moved soon from family interviews um, to, for the first time ever, putting strangers together in StoryCorps booths from opposite sides of the political divides. We tested this with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of participants across the country, and it worked. So what have we learned? We've learned that one small step interviews bring out the opposite impulses of social media. If Twitter can unleash our worst selves, at StoryCorps people realize our great, great, great grandchildren will one day be listening to this conversation and bring their best selves to the interviews. We learned that um, one small step interviews can create intense feelings of connection, empathy, and hope in participants. We've learned that on top of recording interviews, just showing three minute StoryCorps videos about people from one side of the divide to people on the other side of the divide has a highly significant, significant impact on reducing feelings of contempt. These videos can help us see thems as uses. Um, just a small case in point, Annie Parasa um, from the Danny and Annie video is a diehard Trump supporter. Um, we've also seen there's something magical, beautiful, almost addictive about watching people come together in this way. Unfortunately, in the past 18 months, we've also seen the culture of contempt. 
uh, metastasize across the country. A recent Nielsen survey, you know these statistics, 42% of people in each party view the opposition as, as downright evil. Um, and the numbers continue to move in the wrong direction. So we've decided to take one small step to scale beginning in 2020. The dream is to convince the country that it's our patriotic duty to see the humanity in people we disagree with. It's gonna be the biggest, um, hardest, most important thing we've ever tried to do, but given the stakes in the country, we're gonna give it everything we've got because the democracy can't survive in a swamp of mutual contempt. Um, we think of this a little bit as um, uh, a light seeping into a pitch dark room, helping our eyes adjust so we can begin to see one another again. Uh, as Michelle Obama said, it's, it's impossible to hate up close. Um, I'll play one last story, and then, um, and this is this is just a um, an inspirational story um, in the spirit of one small step. I noticed you with the hat, mm -hmm. and I noticed that you were surrounded by some people, and I noticed that they were being kind of threatening, and then somebody snatched your head off your head, and that's the point where I, something kind of snapped inside me, because <laughs> I wear a, um, a Muslim hijab, and I've been in situations where people have tried to snatch it off my head, Wow! and I rushed towards you, and I just started screaming, leave them alone, give me that back. I don't think we could be any further apart as people, and yet it was just kind of like this common, that's not okay moment. You are genuinely the only Muslim person I know. I just, <laughs> it's not that I've actively avoided, it's just, yeah. I've just never been in the position where I can uh, interact mm -hmm. for an extended period of time. So I guess my views on uh, the Muslim community have been influenced by a lot of the news articles and, and things of that nature. I feel like a lot of times in the media, you don't see the normal Muslim, the one that listens to classic rock like I do. <laughs> you, don't, you don't meet that Muslim. Can you tell me about where you grew up? What was that part of your life like? So I was born in Baghdad, in Iraq. I moved to the U.S. when I was 10 years old. Okay. Being a, a Muslim girl, I stood out in almost every single way that you can <laughs> in middle school, the worst time to stand out. What about you? How was it like when you grew up? I was homeschooled, mm -hmm. so it was it was a vastly different experience socially. It was I didn't have, I guess, as many friends as most people would. I only went to public school one year of my life, and I got in three fights and I lost all of them. <laughs> I actually lost a lot of friends because of the selection, because of my political stance. So I hope that I can be the reason that someone decides to talk to someone as opposed to just cutting them out of their life or blocking them on Twitter, yeah. you know? I'd like for this to encourage other people to engage in more conversations yeah. with people that you don't agree with. That's what it's all about. I'm so glad I wasn't the only one who felt like that. So if One Small Step speaks, uh, speaks to you, we need your help. Um, to start, as you've heard, Google is putting up a half million dollar match to the people and companies in this room who support this effort or any of the work that we do at StoryCorps. Uh, just as importantly though, we have some of the best marketing minds in the world here today and we'd love your help crafting and amplifying the message of one small step as we take it to the country over the coming years. I know it's far from a perfect analogy, but once upon a time smoking was cool and sexy and then it wasn't. Today, treating people we disagree with with disgust, even cruelty, is cool and sexy, and that needs to change. It feels like we're walking closer and closer to the edge of a cliff, and we need to find a way to step back before it's too late. I'm gonna leave you with three quick quotes. The first is from Nelson Mandela, who said, it never hurts to see the good in another person. They often act the better because of it. Um, second, the first ever StoryCorps corporate sponsor when we were um, a tiny organization in our first booth in, in uh, Grand Central Terminal was Hebrew National Hot Dogs. And uh, their motto, of course, is we answer to a higher authority. Um, and in these difficult days, I think we all answer to a higher authority. Finally, we partnered with Google um, uh, on Veterans Day this past year on a two-day doodle and uh, featuring stories of vets who have come to StoryCorps. And one of these stories was a guy named um, Zach Skiles who was interviewed by his dad, Scott. Zach served 
in Iraq and he came back with very serious PTSD. He ended up homeless and they came to StoryCorps to talk about it for the first time. Um, and not too long ago, I met Zach, the dad, um, Scott, the dad, at an event, and he handed me a slip of paper and he said, this is a quote that's really helped carry me through um, these hard times and I want you to have it and see it. And it was a quote from a theologian I'd never heard of named Frederick Buechner. Um, very simple quote, it said, here's the world, beautiful and terrible things will happen, don't be afraid. So it takes courage to participate in one small step and it's gonna take some courage for corporations to partner with us on this effort. But these times uh, call for courage and I hope you'll join us.